Welcome to Access Asia on France 24 coming up in today's show. Opposition to American military presence in Japan grows. Tens of thousands demand the closure of U.S. bases in the southern island of Okinawa. And we examine the controversial ties between India's ruling party and the Hindu nationalist movement, RSS. Plus, the ancient tradition of matchmaking gets a makeover in modern-day China. But first, in Japan, the presence of U.S. military bases on the southern island of Okinawa has been a long-standing controversial issue. However, the rape and murder of a Japanese woman by a U.S. Marine, as well as other crimes committed by servicemen, have reignited the debate over the presence of American armed forces. Tens of thousands of people are protesting and demanding the closure of the U.S. base. Our correspondent Justin McCurry reports. The searing heat couldn't stop 60,000 people from protesting at a sports stadium in the Okinawan capital of Naha on the 19th of June. They were there for one reason to demand that the U.S. close its military facilities on the island, which is home to more than half the 47,000 U.S. troops stationed in Japan. It has already been too long. Okinawa does not need U.S. military bases. They should leave. The prefecture's governor, Takeshi Onaga, is a prominent figure in the anti-base movement. The central government has to understand that the inhabitants' anger has reached its limit. We cannot forgive that Okinawa's people shoulder the burden of U.S. bases and make such a huge sacrifice. The demonstration was called after a former U.S. Marine was arrested in connection with the rape and murder of 20-year-old Irina Shimabukuro. The young woman who was killed was about my age. It could have been me. It could have been my friend. Kenneth Franklin Shinzato was charged with Shimabukuro's rape and murder in late June. The 32-year-old, a civilian employee at the Kadena U.S. Air Force Base, now faces a long prison term. It is significant that Okinawan people already think he's guilty. The reason is that he worked with the U.S. Marines, and everyone here thinks U.S. Marines are evil. In fact, crimes committed by U.S. military personnel account for just 1.3 percent of all recorded crimes on Okinawa, leading some to say it's unfair to demonize American troops. You can't judge uh, the entire Marine Corps community on the actions of one bad individual. But by and large, I think Americans, they get along with the local populace. But the local media is not going to report on that. Two weeks after Shimabukuro's body was found, tensions on the island rose again after a female U.S. sailor collided with two cars after crossing into the wrong lane. Two people were injured. The sailor was found to have been drinking, leading U.S. naval authorities to impose a temporary alcohol ban. The crimes come as Tokyo and Washington are trying to win support among Okinawans for the controversial relocation of a U.S. Marine air base from an overcrowded city to an offshore location in Henoko, a village on the island's north coast. You are no, good no, base. You are no, no base! No base! No base! Plans for the new base have angered local people, who say it will increase the risk of accidents and destroy the local marine environment. Since construction work began, the dugongs have stopped coming here to feed. The base will have a really negative impact on the environment. Many Okinawans disagree with the claim that the presence of U.S. troops is good for Okinawa's economy. This shopping mall, for example, was built last year on land formerly occupied by a U.S. base and now welcomes 12 million people a year. At first, the Okinawan economy was weak. U.S. bases helped the economy develop and at one time accounted for half of the island's revenue. But today, they account for just 5 percent. Okinawa would benefit far more if the U.S. bases were turned over to develop private businesses. Anti-base demonstrators plan to continue putting pressure on Tokyo and Washington. They'll soon send a statement to Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and President Barack Obama, calling for the Marines to be withdrawn from Okinawa. Let's cross now to Assam in northeast India. It's one of the country's poorest and most ethnically diverse regions. Well, it's here that the ruling BJP party has relied on a political alliance with the hardline Hindu nationalist movement to win support. But the RSS has a controversial past, and it's even been banned several times. 
Hindu prayers start the day at a school in Assam, northeast India. It's one of hundreds set up by the nationalist group RSS. The organization has been building support for the ruling BJP party, and its efforts appear to have paid off. In May, Narendra Modi's party won Assam state elections for the first time ever. The campaign played on fears of a perceived influx of Muslim migrants from neighboring Bangladesh. Migrant people, the we have, uh, they have no relation with our language, they have no relation with our uh, uh, religion, with our culture. They started uh, madrasas in, uh, in their area and they teach us Arabian languages. Discontent, poverty and distrust are rife here. Rioting between Muslims and indigenous people over land rights killed 38 in 2012. But the BJP denies playing the religious card. If somebody is detected, we'll release them from the voter list. Then we'll think what else can do. But there will be no social unrest. There will be no provocation from the either side to do something immediately. Because our society has evolved. The Assam win gives the BJP a foothold beyond its traditional base in India's north and west. RSS has been drumming up support, including in tea plantations, where many workers earn less than $2 a day. But experts say the BGP faces challenges working with local partners. When you bring in too many leaders from non-RSS background, then the, there's a conflict inbuilt. Because the person who is coming from the other party into the BJP finds it often enough alien because the RSS calls the shot there. Some see the BJP's win in Assam and gains in Kerala in the south as a sign it now holds wider national appeal. But the real test will come at the next nationwide election in 2019. Next, if you're in a big city or a small town, finding that special someone can be hard no matter where you live. Well, in China, traditional matchmaking has been practiced for thousands of years, and we take a look at what the modern-day couples market looks like. Here's Miriam Saab. Chen Jingling may have taken the back seat, but when it comes to navigating the roadmap to love and marriage, this local matchmaker leads the way. If you like the girl we're going to meet today, tell me. If not, we can try and find another one. I promise I will find you someone. Today, the matchmaker is taking one of his top clients, Li Lianfa, to meet a prospective partner in a field. He spent the last seven years searching for a wife without success, at an expense of up to 4,000 Chinese yuan, or 540 euros per year. I've met with so many women. If you add them up, I've met between 50 and 60 women. I don't have any feelings left. This process has made me numb. It doesn't even matter whether it will be successful this time. Accompanied blind dates in neutral places are customary. Marriage negotiations can drive a hard bargain. It's not uncommon for women to ask for cars, houses or money to secure partnership. This time around, sparks fail to fly, so it's back to the drawing board. It's getting harder and harder to link up singles. 80% on my books are men, and only 20% are women. Logistically, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of meetings for a woman to find the right match. The success rate is very low. The courtship conundrum is not just confined to the countryside or men. In the heart of Beijing, parents gather to show pictures and the credentials of their unmarried children in a veritable meat market. Travel executive Jiang Yinmi is 32 years old and single. By the Chinese government standards, she is a, quote, leftover woman. It's a stigma she's determined to shake off. I don't feel embarrassed when I talk to people about being single at my age. I think perhaps the concept is different. Some people will think that being single is the same as being abandoned. I don't feel this way. 
According to the Xianjiao Tong University, balancing the love equation in China is going to get even more complex, with the addition of around 30 million single men expected in the coming years. Next, wrestling is Mongolia's most popular sport. It's a tradition that's been practiced for centuries by men. But in the past few decades, there's been a push to fund women's national teams. And it's opened the door to a whole new field of future champions. So much so, there's hope for gold during the upcoming Rio Olympics. Clément Bonnereau has more. Meet Batsitseg Saron Zonbold. Her name means unbreakable flower, and she's a national hero here in Mongolia. The 26-year-old women's wrestler brought back bronze at the last Olympics in London. Now she's hoping to claim the gold medal in Rio this year. Mongolian women are like warriors. They're really strong. That's why traditionally it's easy for them to become successful wrestlers. And that's why a lot of our women and girls choose this sport. Though wrestling is Mongolia's most popular sport, few women have entered the ring. Women's wrestling has only been in the Olympics since 2004. Soron Zonbold started training as a child. Now her team is among the best in the world. I was watching TV and I saw these women wrestling and then I said to my teacher, this is really nice. And then I decided to learn wrestling and my teacher helped me. Soron Zonbold currently trains twice a day and has to follow a strict diet. She also has plans for the future. She says she's hoping to get married after the Games. Well, now we'll leave you with images from Japan. This is where people are lining up for a record-breaking ride. This new Ferris wheel in Suita City is Japan's tallest at 123 meters. The wheel has 72 gondolas and one rotation takes about 18 minutes. We certainly better not be afraid of heights to enjoy this ride. That's it from us here at Access Asia. We'll see you again next time.